today is from Matthew 10, verses 1 through 15. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanman, <laughs> and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve went out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and in no town of the Samaritans. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff. The laborers deserve their food. Whenever you enter a town or village, you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. The house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that town or house. Truly I say to you, it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Electric shaker. <laughs> Scripture that Joe read this morning, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off today. Wow. Joe's, yes, Joe's day's off today. Uh, but I warned you, didn't I? I warned you all that I was going to uh, kind of surprise you in June with some shocking scriptures that talk about the requirements that the New Testament lays out for those who want to follow Jesus. Uh, last week we were uh, talking about Paul's letter to the Corinthian church where uh, he tells them to agree with one another. <laughs> so I started you out in the shallow water because that wasn't too bad. We didn't struggle too much with that one. Uh, first of all, it was Paul and, you know, Paul. And, uh, you know, yes, he was the most important and influential founder of the church in this world. But he was also human, you know, he was just a regular guy. Um, even though he had this dramatic conversion experience with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, he was just a regular guy. Uh, he had regular human hang-ups, <coughs> like we all do. And once we established that, it was a little bit easier for us to, uh, to work with this agree one another passage. But what happens when you run across a passage uh, like Michael read, where Jesus comes off like a jerk, right? And, and that doesn't even sound right coming out of my mouth, you know? Uh, uh, it's Because it's, this is Jesus, right? This is Jesus, the one who we confess to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who we call Lord and Savior of the whole earth, the one whose path that we Christians have pledged to follow. Right here in the first gospel of the New Testament, only one chapter after Jesus calls his last disciple, Matthew, he sends those disciples out into the world with these instructions. Stay the heck away from the Gentiles and the Samaritans. Now, granted, that's the Jesse Kearns interpretation of this, but it doesn't sound a whole lot worse uh, than go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of Israel. So, um, I read a story once about a guy who was touring the, the Pinewood Studios in England 
uh, when he was a kid. It's a it's a big movie story, kind of a uh, movie uh, studio, kind of like Universal Studios or something. And he was there. This was so cool. He was there when they were filming the 1989 Batman movie. And but, uh, Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, if you remember, was the guy who played Bruce Wayne in Batman. And the thing was, is Michael Keaton was a chain smoker. And so this writer of this story was remembering how horrified he was to see his hero, Batman, right there on the Pinewood Studio lot, in costume, smoking. And you got to understand, he, he, he was a little kid. Uh, he was hardly old enough to know that Batman was a fictional character and not somebody who was an actor playing him. And it rocked his boat. Uh, so here's the question. Have you ever had one of those moments? Have you ever had one of those moments uh, where, where you had a hero or a mentor that, that you placed on a pedestal and then you figured that they could do no wrong and then you found out they were human. <laughs> now for every person whose world is rocked by this realization, there's also someone else who's, who's sort of comforted by that. Uh, it's like, you know, hey, this person is just like anyone else. Uh, in fact, in some ways, this person is like me. Uh, however you want to look at it, the realization that someone that you admire, uh, someone flesh and blood, goes through some of the same trials and temptations that you do. No matter how you look at it, that is an impactful thing. When you realize somebody is human, uh, a hero, it's impactful. But again, we're not reading about Batman here, are we? Uh, we're not dealing with a camp counselor or a teacher or a mentor or a singer or anybody else that we admire and put up on a pedestal. We're talking about Jesus. And... To complicate matters even more, starting in verse 11, Jesus tells the disciples to specifically seek out only people who are worthy and give them peace. But if they're not worthy, you take that peace back. You take it away. And, and if they don't welcome you or listen to you, you just shake the dust off your feet and get out of town and let God's judgment fall on them. And by the way, that judgment is going to be even worse than the judgment laid upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you're not familiar with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it did not end well. <laughs> We're talking scorched earth here. Again, what is, what is going on here? This does not sound like Jesus. But... Remember last week, what is the first thing that we do, the first rule in approaching a passage of Scripture that baffles us? What do we do? Context. Context. We, we take a look at the context in which that passage was written. You find out the who, what, where, when, and why. You approach it like a journalist. So, so let's talk about the who, okay? Um, this is Matthew's Gospel. And remember that there's not just one story of Jesus. We have four stories of Jesus in the New Testament. And two of them start from birth. They all go to Jesus' death and resurrection. And three of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of follow the same timeline and, and deal with some of the same events. And then you've got John. John is very different. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to set aside John. And of the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew is the most Jewish-flavored of the Gospels. Okay? In other words, uh, it has the most Jewish worldview. And there's nothing wrong with that, because Jesus was a practicing Jew. What? What are you talking about, Jesse? Jesus was a Christian. <laughs> no, he was not a Christian. Jesus followed the law of Moses, 
He, he uh, followed the prophets. Um, he, he observed the high holy days. He followed the customs. Mind you, he had his own little take on some of the customs, which set him apart from other, uh, other rabbis at that time. Uh, he was unconventional, but he was not a Christian. Matthew paints the most Jewish picture of Jesus, and that tells us that this gospel was clearly written to the Jews, right? And Matthew writes that Jesus' top priority, his top priority in mission and ministry is to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, and, and this was a lot like the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, they were telling the people to reclaim their faith, reclaim their tradition, reclaim their relationship with God, uh, be the people who God called you to be. Uh, you are God's chosen. You are God's chosen. This is clear throughout Matthew's gospel, especially right here in this passage. And this wasn't the first time that Jesus said uh, that his mission was to reclaim the lost shape of Israel, nor would it be his last time. But somewhere along the line, things change as far as Jesus' uh, attitude uh, about all of this and, and how Jesus deals with those who are not among the lost sheep of Israel. And a key story in understanding how this plays out is in Matthew 15, where Jesus seems to disrespect a Canaanite woman who just wants him to heal her daughters. Get this. This is, this is, what, she, this is what Jesus says to this Canaanite woman who only wants him to heal his daughter. Jesus said, listen, I came here to claim the lost sheep of Israel. It is not fair to take children's food and serve it to the dogs. He's calling this woman a dog, or at least the Canaanites. And since she's a Canaanite, by default, she becomes a dog, right? And you think, oh boy, there goes Jesus acting out of character again. What is going on here? But that woman, she snapped back and she says, yeah? Well, even the dogs eat the crumbs at the master's table. And Jesus replied, woman, you have great faith. And then he heals her daughter right there on the spot. Two chapters back, back in chapter 8, um, Jesus healed a Roman centurion's son, and he marveled at this non-Jewish person's faith. In fact, he was so impressed, he said, I haven't found this kind of faith in all of Israel. So you can see how Jesus' attitudes towards uh, the Gentiles, those who aren't Jewish, is, is sort of morphing and evolving uh, until finally, after his death and resurrection, he, he gathers those disciples together again and he commissions them to go into all the world and to teach all nations. That's a whole lot different than the first time he gathered these disciples together, right? Yep. A lot different than that first commission. Uh, you know, we just go to the Jews and heck with everybody else. And this is a whole lot different. But why would Matthew do this? Why would Matthew portray Jesus like this? Because, you know, we, we think, well, Jesus knew exactly why he was coming. He, know, he knows exactly why he came. He had a predetermined plan. He knew all along that he was going to spread his... Uh, good news to all the world. He must have been just messing with those disciples uh, during that time, you know, he, uh, telling them that his message was only for Israel. He really didn't mean that. Uh, there's, there's no contradiction in anything that Jesus says. He was perfect in every way. No, we're, we're, just, we're just reading this story in chapter 10 and chapter 15 all wrong. We're just reading it all wrong. We're missing the point. Uh, you know, I mean, it, what he 
you mean? This Canaanite woman is teaching Jesus a lesson? No, Jesus is supposed to teach her a lesson, right? To suggest otherwise just makes Jesus look too human. Well, the problem is, is he was, okay? Uh, and that's the beauty of the story uh, of Jesus, no matter which gospel you read it in, because he was human. Okay, but wasn't he divine? Yes, he was. Fully human and fully divine. And that's the tension in the gospels. That's where, that's the fun of the gospels, because there's that tension. Uh, maybe Matthew just emphasize that humanity in a different way than those other gospel writers. Because Matthew's audience was for who? The Jews. The Jews. Okay. See, the Jews needed to hear that Jesus came for them. Uh, he needed to be the, the shepherd of the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, that that's how his ministry started out, according to Matthew. Jews first, the Gentiles, the Samaritans, the Samaritans, those so-called Jewish people who did their own thing instead of, of adhering to the law like the real Jews did. No way. Let, let them burn like Sodom and Gomorrah. But then as the gospel goes on, these Gentiles... And these Samaritans start growing on Jesus, right? He starts to see that they have faith. In fact, more faith than some of the Jews, these God-fearing Jews. And they wanted Jesus all to themselves, right? Until finally, after all is said and done, after his earthly ministry ended, and this, this new ministry, as uh, the resurrected Christ begins, he extends his welcome to all people. And all means all. Remember when I said that sometimes knowing that our heroes are only human can either uh, damage us or strengthen us? Some people cannot get their heads wrapped around Jesus changing his mind. They just, they, they can't do it. They can't even entertain the possibility that his attitude towards the Gentiles and the Samaritans somehow evolved. Because that, that somehow takes away from his divinity. But for me, it actually helps me. It helps me because I look at all the people that I've marginalized in my life. All the people who I thought weren't really worth the effort. Uh, all those people that I just shook the dust off my feet because I didn't particularly like them. Especially if they didn't want to hear what I had to say. But how can I continue to do that? To have that kind of attitude towards people that I don't particularly like when I see Jesus come to the realization that everyone matters. That everyone deserves love. That everyone deserves to hear and maybe even respond to the good news that God is reconciling the world. How can I say no to Jesus' example, to Jesus' transformation? Jesus, the one whose footsteps I am required to follow. When I say yes to being a disciple, I say yes to being like Jesus. And Jesus calls me and shows me how to change my attitude and how to love others as God loves them.